is from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. <clears throat> Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. I'm going to do the prayers of intercession. So please, Lord. Thank you. Um, I want to say, uh, firstly, uh, a huge thanks to everybody uh, who worked behind the scenes, who prepared and supported the World Day of Prayer uh, on Friday. Uh, it was a really powerful moment and experience. So uh, to those from the church who made the tech work, who opened up, who hosted, uh, who led, thank you so very, very much indeed for uh, a really powerful time uh, together. And I just felt as I listened to the service and, and followed it through, um, that service, I guess, was prepared months and months and months ago. But in God's timing, actually every word of that service was appropriate for everything that is happening uh, in Ukraine and across the borders of the countries that are there too. Um, which caused me to come away feeling actually <laughs> God still has things under control. And, and that lovely song, that we just sung together uh, has prompted me really to just flip the order of service around this morning. So we're going to share together uh, for our prayers. And I wanted our prayers, uh, particularly this morning, to be for Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, uh, the people of Poland uh, and Moldova, Estonia, uh, those countries, uh, Serbia, that just surround there, uh, uh, and the fear and anxiety. And we're going to do it uh, this way. In a moment, I'm going to read uh, the set psalm uh, for today, which just speaks into that process too. Um, and then we're going to sing together just the, the simple verse that says, He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because it's so easy for us to become overwhelmed by the dark thoughts, the, the fears of hopelessness that often accomplish, uh, accompany helplessness at times like this. And I just want, as we pray together, for us to sort of affirm that Jesus is Lord, that this isn't the end of the battle. Uh, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is slaughter. I was sharing with the nine o'clock uh, family. Um, you know, as I've been troubled in my heart and, and, and prayed, that the only prayer that, I, that I've really been able to make is that Putin should find salvation. That Putin should know something of the love of God that will break into a heart 
that just seems to be dominated by evil. We're going to be talking about the work of the evil one uh, this, this morning. That's, that's the lectionary reading uh, for today. But he will not have control. He will not have victory. And the only thing, I, I mean, we're going to pray for our politicians and peacekeepers, but it seems to me that, that there needs to be that revival that hits right into the very heart of the government of Russia, because we know this isn't the Russian people that are causing this. And so we're going to pray for Russia uh, as well as we pray this morning. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of introduce some sort of topics as we, as we pray. Um, and then pray in your heart, pray out loud if, if you want to. Um, don't feel that you have to be particularly British about it and sort of wait for somebody else to stop praying before you can start praying if you want to. If two or three people are praying out loud at the same time, that's okay. That's okay. God's good at multitasking. Um, uh, and then, but then between each of those sections, we're going to come back to he is Lord. He's risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then we're going to conclude uh, with the Lord's Prayer together. So let me read to you Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone, you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample under your foot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ And so we bring before God this morning people unknown to us, but people who are living every moment of every day in fear, in apprehension, and in uncertainty. and take aid to the people of Ukraine, the folk in Poland and Moldova and Estonia and others who have opened up their homes and their houses to take in refugees. And we pray for the people of Moscow, of Russia, who will be hit by all that's going on, uh, by all the acts that are taking place to constrict the economy ordinary people who have nothing to do with the responsibilities but will feel something of the pain. Thank you. 
Yeah. Amen. Amen. We pray, Lord, that you guide people as they go in, as things go in the day, that you guide them to meet up with people as they want to take people out to mothers and children and vulnerable mm. people. We pray, Lord, that in the context of war, that you will guide them and uh, put your eye upon them, Lord, that they might be able to meet up with the people they are wanting to rescue or bring. Amen. Amen. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. He is Lord. so we pray for world leaders and influencers that God will raise up amongst them peacemakers as well as peacekeepers that we have we will have eyes to see an outcome that is yet blinded to us and for wisdom and courage to make stands against all that is evil. to their family those who grieve and mourn for those they have loved for security that they feel has been lost and I pray for my brothers and sisters that indeed there will be a wisdom and an insight a prophetic voice that will resound through that land that they will know that you are the everlasting God, that you protect them under your wing, 
that still in the midst of darkness and evil, miracles happen, that love can be shared, that forgiveness is a reality. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so we're going to share together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. I invite you to use whichever version you wish, whichever language you wish, but to pray it with the depth of meaning in these dark days. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so to conclude our time together of prayer, I invite you to stand and to sing and affirm with every fiber of your being that he is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. He is Lord. Thank you. I guess I, I'm not a lectionary person. You know that by now, don't you? I tend not to sort of go where the lectionary goes, primarily because I'm too lazy to do the study that is required uh, to go with it. So I don't want you to think good of, of me at all. I'm a lazy blighter, uh, really. Uh, but this Sunday, I think, could not have been a, a more sort of God-given message uh, for us, because if we ever needed to talk about the battle between good and evil, today is the day that we need to address it. Today is the day that we need at least to sort of begin to settle our hearts and our minds, which is so clearly identified in the story that we have, which we know as the temptation of Jesus, uh, the 40 days that he spent in the wilderness. 
I want to say right at the very beginning that it's not without consequence, I think, that of course Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel says that this event occurred immediately after the baptism uh, of Jesus. Uh, Matthew says that after the baptism of Jesus, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. Luke's Gospel says after he left the Jordan, he was taken by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. There is something significant that we need to just pause and reflect on, that so often after we have had a spiritual high, very quickly follows a wilderness or a spiritual depth in our experience. We, we see it reflected in Scripture so often. Um, Elijah and the battle uh, against the gods of Baal, I mean, what an amazing victory uh, that was, you know. Uh, he set himself against all these false prophets in, a, in an amazing and miraculous way. Uh, God intervenes um, and, and everybody is defeated. You would think that for Elijah, he would now on this mountaintop experience, his kudos was sort of set within the people that from here on in, he's just going to journey and sort of, well, just wallow in the amazing miracle that has been presented before unbelieving people. Right before unbelieving people, God has sort of affirmed him in an awesome way. But what do we discover? I see that within days, he's now running, scared for his life. He goes and hides in a cave for fear of what's going to happen to him. All the sort of sense of hope, all the confidence that he's had to confront the prophets of Baal seems to have just, well, it's gone like a a flat glass of fizzy pop. It just disappeared. There's nothing there uh, at all. We find again and again, after the experiences, for Mary and Joseph, they've come to Bethlehem. They've given birth to the Son of God. They've, they've held him in their arms. And almost immediately, they now need to flee for their life into Egypt and into a period of isolation. And I guess for lots of us here, we could talk about the mountaintop experience that so very quickly is followed by something of a, almost a wilderness experience. Now, not directly related to our gospel, which I'm going to get back to. This is just an aside. That, that I want to say that as a body of believers or as an individuals, we should not be surprised that when it is that the Spirit of God begins to awaken within us a hunger and a thirst after the things of God, when it is as a congregation or a body of believers, revival begins to break out and the hearts and the minds of people turn resolutely towards God, we should not be surprised that we stir the evil one at the same time. Because all the time that we're complacent, all the time that we don't believe that God could do mighty miracles and mighty acts, all the time that, that we sort of live in that sense of expectation that nothing's going to change, nothing's going to be any different, that we're going to carry on in the same old way that we've done things, holding on to our past in the sense that somehow we think our future is invested solely and uniquely in the things that happened for the forebearers. When we're at that sort of point of apathy in our Christian faith and in the acts of believers, why should the devil worry about this? Because nothing's going to happen. When it is that revival begins to happen, when it is that there's a real movement of God's Spirit amongst his people, whether that happens corporately or individually, don't be surprised that the devil doesn't come whispering in your lug hole a few days later. It's part of life. So now we find that Jesus is in this wilderness experience 
and he's gone there intentionally. Now, in many ways, uh, this is the first Sunday of Lent, if you hadn't uh, clocked on to that. And in many ways, over the years, we've diminished what Lent is about. We've made Lent about giving up chocolate. I'm resolutely standing against that uh, <laughs> principle, I want you to know. Um, over the years, we've made Lent about giving up the things that, that we find pleasure in. Normally it's about food or activities for a short period of time. Lent has never been that. Lent has been about a period where the church, the body of believers, is called together to pray and to fast. Now, the praying we can do okay. The fasting I struggle with. Now, um, why do people fast? Well, the first thing is that fasting is a discipline of Scripture. Fasting is something that God invites us to participate in because it, it centers our very being, not on what our needs are, but on who God is. Now, I don't want to suggest that you should fast for 40 days straight off. Uh, I do want to suggest that we might explore what it means to fast because that's, at the heart of fasting is about waiting on God for his provision and his providential care. Uh, at the heart of fasting is recognising that we cannot provide solely for all our needs ourselves. So if it is that you want to experience fasting, um, don't start with 40 days. I mean, you, want to, may, you may want to start with a 12-hour fast. And it might be a fast that just says, actually, I'm not going to physically eat food. I'm going to take in liquid uh, for 12 hours and then gradually expand it. It, it is hard. It is tough. I mean, I, I've got to tell you, dear, I, if you want to know the best way to fast then that I have discovered, and for no money at all, I will share it with you this morning. The best way to fast for me is between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Never once have I broken that fast. It, it, it's a really good place to, to start. Fasting is important because it undergirds our intention to pray. And for some of us, you know, praying is hard enough, isn't it? To find that intentional discipline, to set aside specific time on a regular uh, moment uh, to be able to do it. It doesn't come easy to us. And I'm not pretending uh, that it does. You know, don't just be the sort of people that, that throw the odd prayer dart towards heaven. You know, when I've got a need, when I've got an anxiety, when there's something that's not going right, then I'm going to engage with God. Don't be the sort of people who, when you come to pray, think it's all about the things that you need to say. The most effective prayer is when we absolutely say nothing whatsoever, but we're silent before God. Some of you know that one of the things I've been saying at some of the groups at the moment is, I need to hear what God is saying to you in prayer, not what you're telling God in prayer. Because somehow we forget that element of praying, of the listening and discerning what it is and sharing that discernment with others. So Jesus comes into the wilderness and he begins this 40 days of fasting. I love the understatement of Luke when he says, he fasted for 40 days and he was hungry. Well, Luke has this ability to make this understatement. So it's not surprising that the first temptation that comes the way of Jesus is one where the, the devil speaks into him that, that somehow because of his human need, actually um, that needs to be taken care of primarily. You're hungry? You know. Um, just an aside, did you notice that what it says... That the, the devil says to him, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God. Now, if you want to know when the devil's sitting on your shoulder and whispering in your ear, he'll always sow doubt into your mind. The Holy Spirit brings to us assurance. 
It says in the epistles that the Holy Spirit is given as an assurance that we are adopted into the family of God. Now, the opposite of assurance is doubt. That's what the devil does. He comes and says, if you are. Uh, Matthew's Gospel uh, contains the genealogy of Christ. Matthew's Gospel wants the Jewish believer to see that, that Jesus was descended from David. Luke, actually in the chapter previous to that, takes the genealogy not back to David, but all the way back to Adam that says, and here is the Son of God, who before time began was there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Nothing was created without him that was made. Luke plants Jesus right there at the very beginning. So the devil comes and says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God. And, I've, and, and in, he's appealing to God, to Jesus' pure humanity, to the physical element of what it is to be hungry, what it is, what is the need to be fed. <clears throat> of course, on every occasion, uh, Jesus also gives to us a clue as to how it is that we can respond to the doubts. Because what Jesus does is he takes himself back to the scripture. He takes himself back into the word of God. And he says that, you know, sometimes reasoning is not sufficient for us. For some reason, we, we think that, and, I, and I, know, you know, I thank God for the intelligence that we have. I thank God for our ability to be able to reason things through. But it's not always sufficient. You know, John Wesley, in one of his sermons uh, about the need, that all have the need of salvation, speaks of the fact that we live in a fallen world. And if the, fall, if the world is fallen, then the thought thinking process of humanity has also fallen. It's not complete. It's not whole. And he goes on to say, and yet so often we depend upon the fallen thoughts of a fallen world to determine how the church should think. Hmm. He was a wise old soul, was John Wesley, I reckon. And Jesus says, actually, I need to lay aside all reason, all rationality. And what I'm going to depend upon is not what I feel but what God's Word says. And the first temptation is purely about that physical ability, that, that need where so often it is that what drives us to plead before God is not things of a bigger kingdom value, but it's about things that we need and we want. The second temptation that comes uh, along, of course, is that... Uh, it is that Jesus is taken up onto the temple and the, the devil says to him, actually on this occasion he doesn't say if you are the son of God. What he says to him is cast yourself down because you know that nothing can be harm you if you say who you are because God will send his angels, quoting from Psalm 91, and he will rescue you. It's about that sense of protection, emotional protection, I want to say. All of us have fears and anxieties, don't we? I mean, they're part of living. And, and my heart goes out for myself and for others too, when our anxieties and our fears and our sense of helplessness can, can sometimes just overwhelm us. Um, we, as the body of believers, need to be really careful that sometimes in our language, we don't, I mean, we, we'll talk about, you know, freely in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says that I am come that you should have life and that you should have it in all its fullness. There are hard words to hear and respond if it is that you've probably just lost your job or somebody's told you that, that your health is failing badly. You know, we're really bad at sometimes lifting folk up without recognizing the difficulties that we go through. Now, our emotional and our mental health are so very closely linked together to our spiritual health. 
many years ago. I remember Selwyn Hugh, uh, uh, Daily, Daily Bread, uh, CWR, all comes out of Selwyn Hugh's hearts. He worked really hard at the wholeness of, of who we are as beings. I remember him saying to a group of pastors, when somebody comes to me and, and says, this is Selwyn speaking. Somebody comes to me and says, uh, Selwyn, I'm really through a wilderness experience. I'm not hearing God speak uh, to me. I don't seem to be able to get anywhere in my devotions. You know, I am having a really tough time. What should I do? And Selwyn's saying, the first thing I say to him is, when was the last time you went and saw your GP? When's the last time you went and got yourself checked out to see whether your physical well-being and your mental well-being is impacting your spiritual well-being. Because we are made body, soul, and spirit. That's who we are. And if we ignore any one of those dimensions, it's to the detriment of the others. We're interconnected as human beings. That's what makes us different from any other part of God's creation, is that interconnectedness. And so the devil comes to him and says, you can cast yourself down there because nothing hard is going to happen to you. Jesus knew everything that there was to know about pain and suffering and stress and anxiety. Will you hear that? Do you remember the story when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before the crucifixion? And he's praying. And the gospel, John's gospel says, and he, and he prays, Father, if it be possible, let this cup be taken from me. And John's gospel says, and drops of blood, like sweat, fell from his brow. Now, John didn't know that when he wrote that. Luke, I doubt if Luke was even aware. But doctors will tell you, when we are under extreme stress that is almost beyond comprehension, it is possible for us to sweat blood from our brow. Don't tell me that Jesus didn't know about pain and suffering and anxiety. He was fully human, as well as both Luke's and Matthew's genealogy says he was fully divine as well. There's that coming together of heaven and earth found complete in the one man known as Jesus Christ. And the third area of temptation, of course, that the devil comes to Jesus with is the one where he takes him now onto the temple. And he says to Jesus when he's on the temple, that just look at all the kingdoms of the world. If only you'll bow down to, to me, you'll, I'll give you dominion over all of them. If only you'll worship me. Now, there's two significant things that are happening uh, in that passage. The first is where it's placed in the temple. You will know if if you followed the lectionary readings, how good am I getting at this lectionary stuff? If you followed the lectionary re readings last week, it was uh, all about uh, the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, which is where they believed that the, the dwelling of place of God was. Back in the times of Moses uh, and the Exodus, they believed that God dwelt in the Ark of the Covenant, that the, it, everything that was sacred was there, and so God uh, travelled with the people in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, it says that by day, the Ark of the Covenant was in the midst of the people. By night time, it travelled in the front uh, of the people. And then there came, and it says that when Moses received the uh, Ten Commandments, the tablet stones, when he came down, after all the huffle and kerfuffle that had gone on around that, they said that they wanted to build a tabernacle, a, a place that would represent the permanent dwelling of God. Remember the story of the, the uh, transfiguration last week when on the mountaintop experience, Peter uh, see, and the disciples there uh, see uh, Moses and Elijah and Jesus and when it is that they've looked up 
Peter says, as Peter is prone to do, um, always to state the blindingly obvious without ever really thinking through the reality of it, says, let's build a tabernacle here. It was the most natural response because he saw that in these three prophets, in the Son of God, in the two prophets of the old, he wanted to build something that recognised that the presence of God was here. So often we want to trap God into a physical being, building. It's really interesting that Jesus ignores the question of Peter when he says, let's build a tabernacle here. Jesus doesn't even engage in that question. <laughs> Here's the irony. If you travel to the Mount of Transfiguration today, guess what's on top of the mountain? A humongous blimmin' church that, that is there to commemorate everything. Why do we want to constrict God into bricks and mortar? You know, the early church never owned anything at all apart from the hearts of people. And it grew at a phenomenal pace. The Methodist church in China and Hong Kong um, is, is over 420 congregations strong. Do you know how many buildings they own? 13. That's all. We've become so, and I'm grateful for the beautiful building that we find ourselves in. But this isn't where God dwells. God dwells in the heart of human beings. He's our motivation. He's our driving force. He's, he's the, the energy behind everything that we do. He is the compassion that is beyond our understanding. So the place is significant. Because the devil's wanting to say to, to Jesus what he already knew, that actually God doesn't dwell in the temple. God dwells in the world that he's created. The second thing that's significant about it is that the devil is already trying to offer to Jesus what is already rightfully Jesus's. How bizarre is that? If you bow down your knees to me, says the evil one, I'll give you dominion over the world. You already had it. And that's the other thing about the devil. He can only tell you lies. He cannot speak truth. He can only tell lies. And he seeks to delude us. He seeks to dissuade us. He seeks to work away at us, to take us away from the truth and to get us to believe his lies. Jesus once more returns to that which is solid, which is the Word of God, which doesn't change, nor does it pass. And there's one final thing that I want to say before we wrap up these moments. Did you notice at the end of the reading, it doesn't say that Jesus, that the devil left Jesus never to return again. It said... He left him for an opportune time. When you are a believer, when you know what it is to have the Spirit of God living in your life, transforming your thinking, transforming your motives, transforming your relationships with others, do not think that you are immune from temptation. Because that will be another lie that's being whispered in your ear. You see, to be tempted is human. To be tempted is not sinning. What is it, that, that, that old song that we used to sing when we were knee-eyed to a grasshopper? Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. I don't mind being tempted. I don't mind having the devil on my back. Because actually he'll never have the victory all the time I stand on God's word and by God's provision. On the day when the world is faced with what seemingly looks like evil is conquering over good, don't believe the lie. But stand on the truth 
that God's kingdom will stand for eternity, that the values of his kingdom will always be lived out in the lives, not of a building, not of bricks and mortar, but in the likes of you and I, as we seek to live that life. In the midst of temptation, we stand on the victory side because of Calvary, because of Jesus. In a few moments, we're going to share together in Holy Communion. And I want us this morning, just as we receive bread and wine, not just to use it for our own sense of reflection, but recognizing that this is an act, this is a symbolism that unites all of God's people. We'll use different words and we'll do it in different ways and we'll have different understandings of it. I don't think that that's the important thing. I think the important thing is that we remember that Jesus says, when you take this bread, when you drink this wine, remember what I have done for you.